But, uh, but no, we're going to look into the word of God this morning. Amen. Yes. We're going to look into the word of God. Praise God. Our, our subject for today is restoring Peter. We know about Peter, what a wonderful man of God he was, the greatest apostles, one of the greatest apostles. And we are going to look at his life a little bit today. And um, it was interesting because um, um, our brother was sharing about the love of God, our uh, love of God. And, and um, he, he, he wanted to understand the love of God. And, and, and the Lord asked the Peter a question, Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? And uh, um, Jay, we are going to look at that today about the love. Uh, that uh, God asked Peter about. And I think we need to ask that question. When they had finished breakfast, how many of you like food? Breakfast. When they, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than this? Do you love me more than this? In Psalm 23, verse 3, we read, He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. I want to talk to you about restoration. And we all need that in our life sometime, one, one time or another. We need restoration because as Peter was, we are. We often get into the wrong lane of life. And we often walk away from God. And at that moment, we may feel like, well, now I have done this. I am no more worthy to serve God. I, I have disobeyed him. I have, I'm going to just stay, you know, stay down now. Being a, a having failures in life is is not a big deal as long as we realize we have failed and called on God and came out of that fall. We need to be able to get up when we fall and God's grace is there for us to get up. Praise God. So failure is not fatal. It is only giving up that is fatal. So those who have failed in one way or another in your service for God, do not think that you know, you cannot serve God anymore. God wants you to serve him again. God wants you to be of use to his kingdom. And restoring Peter is an example of God, what God wants you, wants to do in your life and in my life. Restoring us to a place of usefulness, to a place of benefit in the kingdom of God. Praise God. Amen. So, so those, who, those who perhaps felt weak in your life and uh, felt that you have wandered too far away from God, this word is for you. Amen. You have hope and we can come back to God and be better than ever for the glory of God. Amen. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than this? That is the question that we need to ponder on. Do you love me more than this? And that question is to me and to you. Jesus is asking a question. Do you love me more than this? And then again in Psalm 23 verse 3 we read about David's prayer. David needed restoration in his life. And so he is saying, having experienced the restoration of God when he sinned and He's saying, he restores my soul. Praise God, he restores my soul. I don't have to be down all the time. He can restore me. He can bring me up and make me useful again. So he Amen. said, he restores my soul. Praise God. He restores my soul. Praise God. When they had finished the breakfast... Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon Peter, Simon son of John, do you love me more than this? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. 
Jesus said to him a second time, Simon, son of man, do you love me? Simon said to him, yes, Lord. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him a third time, do you love me? Simon, son of John. And Simon said, Peter, Simon said yes, Lord. You know that I love you. Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Praise God. So this is uh, an account of a meeting that Jesus had with Simon. This is found in the 21st chapter of the Gospel of John. A good chapter to read and meditate on. In the beginning of that chapter, we see that Simon said, well, <clears throat> I'm going back to fishing. You know, God, Jesus had called them to be workers, to go and fish for men. Jesus said in Luke chapter 5, I will make you fishers of men. That was their calling. And uh, there we read that they left all and followed Jesus. In Luke chapter 5, that is. They left all and they followed Jesus. Now, Jesus has died and he rose again. He showed himself to the disciples more about three times. But in spite of all that, Simon is saying, I'm going fishing. For a, for a moment, seems like he forgot about his call and his mission. In chapter 21, verse 3, we read, And Simon Peter said unto him, I go fishing. And they said unto him, We also go with thee. We also go with thee. Somebody said uh, there was a few ducks sitting on the side of a, of a lake. And one jumps in, let me say, there are ten ducks sitting on the side of a lake. And one jumps into the lake. How many will be left on the on the side of the lake. <laughs> Zero, right? When one jumps, everything, everybody else will jump with him. So Simon said, I'm going to go fishing. And all the disciples that were with him, about seven of them, they said, well, we are going too. All of them forgot about their mission. You know, sometimes what you do can affect some other people. Some bad decision we, we make will affect some other people. What you do can affect, what you don't do also can affect some other people. So be careful in the decisions you make in your life. Be prayerful and ask God's wisdom to make the right decision all the time. So all of them went to fishing. And what happened? Oh, they fished all night, the Bible says... And that night they caught nothing. Nothing in verse number 3. They caught nothing. It was a fruitless night. And then when the morning was come, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples knew not that it was Jesus. It's amazing how the love of God comes after us. How the grace of God reaches out for us in spite of our wrong decisions. In spite of our, our uh, willing or unwilling uh, decisions to go against what God wants us to do. God's grace always follows us. Amen. Men are not like that. When they found, find out that we don't please them, we don't do what they asked us to do. They don't, they don't have that grace often. Sometimes they do, but most often they don't. But, but remember here, the grace of God is always following you. Even when you are in, that, in the wrong path, his love wants you to come back to him. Praise God. 
We may not be all that we can be in the kingdom of God. We know we can be better. But we are just out there. But I tell you this morning, the love of God is after you. Amen. The grace of God is reaching out for you. So that he can woo you into the right path where you can become a positive influence in the life of other people. Praise God. So it is amazing to me to see Jesus standing on the shore of the area where the disciples went to fishing, forgetting their, their mission in life was to catch men for the Lord. But, but Jesus is right there on the shore. And I would think that Jesus had a purpose to be there. He came un, uninvited, unsought. Jesus came. And I praise God for the love of God and the grace of God that comes after me unsought and unexpected. He comes to us. Amen. Praise God. His love is such. His love is such. His grace is such. He will not let us go. He continues to pursue us. Praise God. So because of time, let us go on here. And when they came to the shore, Jesus said, you, you cast your net to the, to the right side. They said, we, we, Jesus said, do you have any fish? And their reply is that we don't have any. We labored all night, Lord, but we did not catch any. And then the Lord said, well, cast the net on the right side of the ship. And you shall find. It's amazing. You know, I can imagine a boat is, you know, so big. And the fish love to swim. And, and, and for some reason, it seems like all the fish came and gathered on the right side of the ship. And they are on the left side fishing all night long. Sometimes life is like that, right? We, we are just doing our thing on the, on the left side. And we don't realize there is a blessing on the, on the, on the right side. We, we just need the Lord to show us the way. See, that's the beauty of knowing the Lord. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. When we don't know where to fish, where do you know what to do? It is the Lord's grace and guidance that comes to us. And the children, you are fishing on the wrong side of the boat. You just go to the right side of the boat and things will be different. Praise God. Amen. We need his grace to show us. Amen. Remember Hagar was in the desert. And she cried out for some water. And the Bible says the Lord opened her eyes. Amen. And she saw water. Amen. 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 She was close to it but it was hidden to her. But it was the grace and the love of God that opened her eyes. I pray today that the grace and the love of God will open our heart. That we can see some things that are hidden to us. Amen. Praise God. Things that can bless us and, and strengthen us and, and move us along in the right direction in life. Praise God. God, open our eyes that we can see. Amen. And, and they had a great catch. And one other point I want to make here is that they had a great catch of um, a nice big fish and you know how many were there? 153 of them. Somebody even counted them in the middle of all these things. Praise God. <laughs> they, you know, uh, they might be told, wow, we, we tried all night long, but look at the catch. Let's count how many we have here. <laughs> Praise God. They're excited about the blessing of God. Count your blessings, name them one by one. Hallelujah. Fish one, praise God. Fish two, praise God. Fish 100, praise God. They began to count and rejoice in the Lord. Amen. Amen. One beautiful thing in that passage of scripture is that even though the fish was big, the catch was great, the Bible says that uh, the net did not tear, break. In verse number 11 we read, And Simon Peter went up and drew the net to the land, full of great fishes, and 150 and 3. For all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. 
We are a church. Our net should not be broken. Amen? Amen. No matter how big it gets, our net should not be broken. broken. Amen. 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 You know, there is a saying in Malayalam, <laughs> He says, he says an old Malayalam saying. You know, it is saying that, what is Olaka? Anyone knows in English for all? This thing you, 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 what is it? <laughs> you know, this is a narrow pipe-like thing, you know. And, and the saying is that if you are agreed together, you can sleep even on that. I don't see anything similar to that here. It's just a round, round thing. But, it, I mean, about, about maybe a couple of inches in diameter, right? A pipe. Imagine a pipe. And the saying is that if you have... If you are in agreement, if you are united, you can sleep on that. Amen. Amen. There were a huge catch of fish, big fish. But the, but the writer of the gospel wanted to make a note there saying, and the net was not broken. Significant. Praise. Sometimes, uh, you know, the church is so small, but the net is broken. People just go different ways. And I pray today... That God will give us this, this assurance that God, though we are many and, and increasing, let our net be not broken. Amen. That is unity. Amen. Praise God. Right. Amen. So the Lord had prepared them food. They found a, a coal burning and, and food on the coal. And eventually this, they, they ate. And that's what we read here. And when they finished breakfast. You know why Jesus came to the shore and stood there? He had a mission. He wanted to talk to Peter. Because Peter one time was so uh, confident that, that, that even though everyone else will be offended at the Lord, he will not be offended. Right? In Matthew 26, verse 33 on, we can read there, this is what he said, Lord, if, if when Jesus told them that the Son of Man will be caught and crucified and all that, he said, Lord, even though all these disciples will leave you, I, I will not leave you. I'm going to be standing there with you. And then he said, uh, you know, I will not deny you. I, I will always be there for you. But on both counts, he failed. He failed. Sometimes we make this bold statement without really thinking what we are saying. And, and we realize it was not proper or right for us to say. But the beautiful thing is here the Lord is dealing with uh, Peter to make sure that he understood. He understood that he learned from his mistakes and his experiences in life. One of the greatest things we can do in our life is that to learn from your experience. Do not repeat the same mistake. Learn from our experience and make corrections in our life as we go along here. So the Lord is trying to figure, find out in, if from his own, from Peter's own word, whether he has learned some experience, I mean, a lesson from his bad experiences. He said, uh, I will not forsake you. I will not leave you. But he did both. He, he, he left Jesus. And, and as he was uh, warming at the fire, a fire coal burning there. And perhaps when he saw the coal on burning on the seaside, he might have remembered that coal back a few days ago where he where sat around and they said, Do you, you are from that man from God. He said, no, 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 no. I don't even know him. Perhaps that coal of fire brought to his mind the incident that happened some time ago. And Jesus pulls Simon to the side and says, Simon, do you love me more than these? Once you told me, even though everyone forsake you, you will not forsake me. Once you told me you will be with me, no matter what, but you did not come through in that either. Now, I want to ask you a question. Do you love me more than this? More than this. 
Now, what could be the more than this there? Jesus could be asking, Simon, we call, I call you to follow me, and you followed me, and I promised you I will make you fishers of men, but I see you fishing for fish right now. Have you forgotten your mission? Do you love these things, your fish, your boat, your net, your catch? You love those things more than me? That is a searching question, isn't it? That is one way of looking at it. A second way of looking at it is, Simon, do you love me more you love your brothers, these brothers, do you love me more than this? I believe that question is asking, raised against each one of us. Where is your love? Where is your love? The first time the Lord asked that question, he used the, the word agape, that, 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 that love that, that is the greatest form of love, the, the, the highest form of love, Agape, that is the love of God. And someone said up until that time, men did not really understood the word agape and, and the love of God. It was so high. Until then, people were used to saying the love, that, that is a, an affection and, and love toward one another, a brotherly love or philo, phileo. But Jesus first asked, do you love me with God's kind of love? Agape love. Now what is the difference between agape love and the brotherly love? Jesus said, love might make a man to give his life for his friend. Remember? Yeah. A friend. Yeah. But the agape love is the love that will make us to give our life for the enemy. Enemy. That's what Jesus did. He loved us while we were yet sinners. He loved us. So he asked, do you love me with that agape love? And, and the answer Peter gave was, I love you with phileo. The, the, the brotherly affection, Lord. You see, there is a beautiful thing to understand here. Peter, in all honesty, could not tell the Lord, yeah, I love you with an agape love. There are times in our life we are asked a question. Even though we, we know the answer is wrong, we just give the wrong answer. For example, I am coming through the checkout line in the customs area. I have summoned the putty, this putty, that putty, everything in my bag. <laughs> and the customs official asks, do you have some food in you? I say no. Because I know the food they are asking is not the kind of food I am carrying, right? <laughs> and then the Holy Spirit convicts me and says, well, I have some fried stuff in there. Sometimes we just say, give an answer which is easy. Even though it is not honest and truthful. But how can Peter stand in the front of the Lord and give an answer that is not true? Because he said, Lord, I love you. And you, you know that. I cannot hide anything from you. There was a time he might have said, yes, Lord, I love you with agape love. But he learned his lesson. He learned that he needed to be humble before God. I don't have the agape love, even though that's the kind of love God wants us to have. Jesus said, you have heard that you love your friends and families, but I tell you, you love your enemies. That's, the, that's God's standard for us, having that kind of love in us. But Peter was very honest, saying, God, I don't, I don't have that, but I have this phileo love. I love you, Lord, but it is a brotherly affection love. He was honest with God. Even the second time Jesus asked, do you agape love me? And even then Peter said, no, Lord, 
I, I have to lay your love towards you. Honest before God. Honest before God. And we need to be honest before God when we come. Because he knows. He knows where our heart is. Two people come, came to pray. One man was a businessman and uh, he wanted a million dollars to close a business deal. So he comes to pray. And so when he comes to pray and stand there praying, he, he hears this another man crying out to God, God, I need hundred dollars. The, the, the creditors are after me, Lord. I need hundred dollars. Please, Lord. This man gets his wallet and, and put a hundred dollars in his hand. And he, wow, my prayer is answered so fast. He was joyful and he left. And the man, the businessman who wanted a million dollars, and he says, now Lord, since I have your undivided attention, <laughs> let's talk about the million dollars. Being honest before God. Being honest before God. When we pray, be honest before God. When we testify, we be honest before God. Because he knows. He knows. Praise God. And the third time Jesus used the same word that Peter used. Isn't that amazing? Peter, now I know you cannot love me with agape kind of love, but I want you to know if you love me with phileo kind of love. Now they are on the same field. Who brought themselves down? Jesus brought himself down to his level so he can be comfortable. And the answer, yes, Lord. And he was grieved in his heart and he said to him, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know everything. You know everything. Our Lord knows everything. So there is nothing. I cannot hide anything from him. In prayer, you can open everything to him and, and talk to him and he will understand. You know everything. You know that I love you, phileo love. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Three times he asked about his love. It was a test of love to see where he was. And three times Peter gave an answer. And three times Jesus commanded him to do something, and that was to feed his sheep. I, I liked the passage when I, when I was reading it. Did you notice that? Jesus is telling him, praise God, you feed whose lambs? Jesus. My lambs. And then the second time Jesus said, you feed my sheep. My sheep. And the third time Jesus said, you feed my sheep. I, I looked at that verses there and I said, my goodness. Jesus is taking ownership of my life. He's saying you are mine. Child of God, when God looks at you, you don't belong to anybody else. He says you are mine. Amen. Praise God. Isn't that amazing? Three times he said, my sheep. My sheep, you are mine. If you have been born again by the blood of Jesus, if you have been born into the kingdom of God, God says of you, you are mine. Smile. God says that you are his, my sheep. And elsewhere he said, my sheep, hear my, Boy. my sheep, Amen. my sheep. And I take a comfort and joy in the fact that God is saying, I belong to him. Amen. Amen. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Praise God. Let us pray. Praise God. The question that comes to us today, do you love me more than these? Do you love me more than your possessions, your business? your family, anything else? Do you, who do you love the most in your life? And if you say, Lord, I love you more than anything else, 
even with the filial of love, brotherly love, affection. How does that compare with our lifestyle, our life activities? Jesus is expecting an answer, saying that, Lord, we love you. We love you. But if I say that, the one who knows everything about me, what he's going to say back to me. You say you love me, but you live like you don't love me. Jesus said, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. So today, may the Holy Spirit help us to search our heart and say, Lord, I need to be restored. I need to be restored. I need to have a purpose in life. I need to love you more than anything. Be dedicated to you and I know life will be much, much better, healthier, stronger. I don't have to go after anything because I have found everything in Jesus. Praise God. Everything in Jesus. Better than rivers of gold and hills of diamonds. Christ is better. Christ is better. Do you love me more than this? Praise God. Father, we praise you this morning for the word of God. We thank you because you came to restore Paul, Peter into a place of usefulness. Thank you, Lord. We thank you because you commanded him to feed your sheep. And we are your sheep, Lord, my sheep. Thank you for taking ownership of our life. We are yours. And let us leave this place today knowing, Lord, that we belong to you, that you say of us, my sheep, my sheep. Praise God. Bless thy children this morning, that their love to you may be the strongest love, may be greater than any other love in their life. They can truly say, yes, Lord. They can truly say with Peter, yes, Lord. We love you. We love you. Praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you please prepare your hearts and your life to receive the communion elements today? We come to break bread and drink from the cup, remembering the, the death of Christ on the cross, remembering how he suffered for us, how he shed his blood for us. We come to celebrate Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. And it is a privilege to join with one another in breaking the bread and drinking from the cup. Jesus said to do it until I come, telling us that he has not yet come, but he is coming soon. We need to be prepared for His coming. Praise God. In breaking the bread and drinking from the cup, we proclaim the death of Christ. We proclaim His soon coming. We proclaim our love for one another. And we proclaim our love for the Lord Jesus Christ. As we reach to get a piece of this bread, we are saying, Lord, we are one together. I am one with the brother or sister who is getting the next piece. We are one. We are one. Lord, when I drink from this cup, this came from, from the grapes, rushed into one, into one. I am one with my brother. There is no difference. Though the catch was great, big was great, the net did not break. Lord, we are one. Keep us within the net, O oh God. Not to be broken and scattered, 
Oh God, let there be unity among us. Praise God. We love you today. Would you please search your heart this morning. If there is any sin, any restoration that you need today, call on him. The Bible says his blood cleanses us from all our sins. As we sing a verse or two now, it's a time for you to examine yourself and ask the Lord to come into your heart, into your life. And if there is any cleansing needed, apply, ask him to wash you in the blood. And if everything is okay, just give him praise and thank him for keeping you pure and holy before you. Let us say, take a little bit time to examine our heart as we sing a verse or two. There is a